Hi folks. Well, it's a Saturday, so I don't have to go to work. So um, we'll crack on with part two of sorting out this uh, battery pack spot welding transformer. And today I'm going to see how well I did on the timings on my pulses and maybe make a few tweaks to the code. Give this a test and see what kind of voltage it puts out and show you what I've been up to designing a case for all of this. So let's go. I was asked in the comments by one Arduino for a little more information on these microwave transformers. Unfortunately, I've only actually got one to show you, but um, you're looking for a transformer out of an older style microwave. Uh, newer microwaves, sometimes called inverter microwaves, will have a much smaller transformer that's designed to run at 15 kilohertz rather than 50, 60 hertz mains. So you want a good old clunky one. Um, ideally with copper windings, they're, they're tending to get a bit cheap these days and using aluminium windings instead. Um, copper windings will be more efficient, it shouldn't really matter given efficiency is not a key goal. And when you get these out of a microwave, there will actually be another set of copper winding on the top here. This is a very fine copper wire, kind of a couple of thousand turns. And uh, just chisel them off with a hammer and chisel, take that out of the way and there will probably also be a set of these like little shim plates stuck in as well in between the mains primary and the higher voltage windings you want to knock out those as well they're something to do with the uh, microwave emitter on the microwave ovens um, it increases the efficiency for that but stops the transformer delivering as much power um, so you need to knock those out as well so all you're left with will just be the mains primary winding and a big gap that you can thread your own windings through. Okay so we're just on the electronics workbench here I've got all of this running off a USB power bank. I'm going to hook up the scope across the outputs of the system and uh, see if my timing of 4 milliseconds and 250 and all the pulse timings are right because chances are they aren't and I can probably just put a small offset to the values directly in the code to fix that. Um, I don't think it's really important but you know, just because I can, I'd like to know that those values are actually the real pulse times. So I've got the first pulse set at 4 milliseconds, then a delay of 256 milliseconds, then a second pulse of 200 milliseconds. And when I click the micro switch, the scope captures our waveform for us with our short, short pulse delay, long pulse output. And uh, zooming in on that a bit, we'll just get this first pulse into the middle. And we can see how long this is. And we're now on one millisecond per division. And you can see this pulse is one, two, three, four, and three quarter long there. So four and three quarter milliseconds. We're about three quarters of a millisecond out on that. Not too terrible. Apparently I didn't have the microphone switched on when I recorded this bit, so I'm going to have to talk over the top and try and remember what I was doing. Um, I've got the multimeter hooked onto the output measuring AC, and we're expecting a very low voltage out of this, and I've got the input plugged into my isolation transformer and variac combination, so I can test this thing fairly safely without risk of killing myself, or at least I'll have to try quite hard to kill myself. So we'll switch everything on now. And we'll start at a fairly low voltage and uh, ramp up from there and see what happens. So to begin with, I'm going to hit this thing with around about 12 volts and uh, see what kind of output voltage we get. It gives us some idea of the ratio and we're getting 0.1 of a volt out here. So at 240 volts, I expect we'd get somewhere around about 2 volts out of this. Uh, we're up to 100 at the moment, getting 0.85 volts or so. And all the way up. And yeah, there we are, we're hitting basically two volts on our output. So nice low voltage, safe to work with, uh, you're really not going to hurt anything, but we'll be delivering hundreds of amps. And on the display, you notice we're pulling 109 watts of power, even with nothing attached to that transformer. Uh, microwave oven transformers aren't designed to be particularly efficient in their operation, and we're not giving it the proper load here. Uh, they're designed very specifically to power the electron gun in the um, microwave transmitter 
inside the microwave and not really suited for much else but we're only running this for fractions of a second at a time so this will be fine for our job. Okay I think it's about time we gave this thing a try. So I've wired up the transformer through the solid state relay now. It's still running off my Variac isolation transformer because I'm a coward and I don't want to die and it'll let me ramp up the voltage gradually so I don't have to start off at full power. And I just found a couple of old broken PCB drills which conveniently broke as a fairly sharp point there. So I'm going to have a go at uh, welding some nickel strips together and see if this is actually functional. And uh, if that works I might try welding a nickel strip to a battery. So I've kept all the main side things over on this part of the workbench. Anything over here should be pretty safe to work with. And I'm actually powering this on 50 volts for now just because I uh, fear death. Right. Let's see what happens if we actually give this something to, to zap. Now this is only going to be about half a volt and I'm not sure you're going to be able to see what's happening. I'm not sure I can bend the wires appropriately. There we go. See if I can get those two aligned on there. This is very, very fiddly to do. seem to have no effect. I'll um, up us to 100 volts, 120 volts. No noticeable effect there whatsoever. I don't know if this is actually working at all. Let's give it the full beans. I was kind of expecting to hear at least a hum to indicate that uh, something was going on. Maybe these drill bits aren't conductive or something bizarre like that. Yeah, certainly heard the magnetic core do a bit of a click then. But no noticeable sign of uh, anything actually happening. So we'll turn up our pulse lengths a bit and give that a try. No. Still no sign of any action. Right, we'll uh, evaluate this with an oscilloscope. After a little probing with the multimeter I discovered that this unit isn't switching the output across even though we're feeding it 3 volts and the LEDs lighting up. So I got a new one out the drawer and this is doing exactly the same thing and um, I'll just check the voltage we're actually feeding in to make sure we meet this 3 to 32 volts rating. Uh, feeding in a pulse now and yeah that looks like we meet 3 volts there 3.09 volts so we're within the rating printed on the front of this thing but these things don't appear to be working. Um, I'm going to try a higher voltage because I do have a higher voltage available on the input to this. I'm not planning on running it off USB. I'm going to feed in 5 volts or thereabouts on a couple of pins over here. But perhaps these need a bit more than their printed 3 volts to actually trigger. I've got this hooked up to my bench power supply so I can gradually increase the voltage on here. And what I've found is that it needs at least 4 volts to switch this on. At which point the magic smoke escaped out of the back of it. I've no idea why. I saw exciting fizzing things happening under the label and it's probably dead now and um, I'm a bit puzzled as to why because there's no load on this, there's no short circuit or anything. We already saw it pulled about 100 watts but we killed our SSR. I'm puzzled. Having just killed this one a couple of minutes ago and I still can't for the life of me work out how that died. There's 5 amp fuses and all sorts in the way of here. There's no way I could have been pushing 40 amps through that sink. So I haven't overloaded it, I'm certain of that. Um, I'm wondering if it was some weird thing that I ramped up the voltage on these terminals gradually and it didn't like being in a partially switched on state. So although it seems a bit foolish to kind of repeat exactly what I just did, I really just want to know if that thing can be driven from a microprocessor output properly. So I've still got my power supply on 4.2 volts which is where it was at when things fried. 
and that is switching on cleanly now I can hear the humming so maybe that was just faulty maybe it was because I ramped it up gradually in fact what I haven't done yet I'm still on 120 volts so I'm gonna crank us up to 240 and see if any smoke escapes now no that's now working as I would have expected things to work so I'm guessing it was the gradual ramp up of the voltage and uh, these things really don't run on 3 volts these things need well at least 4.2 volts apparently otherwise they tend to fry so I'm going to have to modify this circuitry a bit and start running it from its 5 volt pins with some kind of transistor to drive the output rather than driving it straight off the microprocessor. Um, yeah, we're pulling 17 milliamps there to light the LED. Again, maybe that's more than the microprocessor could deliver. So I'm going to have a think, work out how I can modify this circuit and um, I'll be back. Just to satisfy my own curiosity, I'm going to peel the label off here and see if I can uh, spot exactly which bit the magic smoke escaped from. Because there was clearly uh, there was quite a lot of smoke and a few flashes and things like that when this went. So, yeah, some little resistor at that end there, which is on the main side, and another one there. There's the resistors that fried. Just bizarre. I already mentioned I'm not planning on running this off USB and I'm going to find a different 5 volt ish power supply to power this thing from. Uh, this is my old Motorola phone from 1999 or thereabouts. I don't think I've switched it on for at least 15 years so I figured I probably didn't need two power supplies for it so I've pulled one of those to pieces and I'm going to use that as the power supply, supply for this. Um, anyway I said we'd talk about the design a bit so Let's have a look at that. So up until now, I've been using um, Autodesk 123D Design for making my designs. And it, it's a great beginner package because it's really quick and easy to learn. But it starts to become a bit limited when you want multiple components. So I thought it was finally time for me to bite the bullet and learn a better package, um, Fusion 360. So I watched this set of tutorials by Lars Christensen, um, absolutely fantastic set of tutorials, totally brilliant, I cannot recommend them enough. Um, I feel I'm using it like a pro after watching through this set of videos. So using my calipers to get all the appropriate measurements for these boards, I built myself a model in 123D design and uh, very quickly discovered that I apparently can't measure things properly. So I modified my model and discovered that I uh, still can't measure things properly. But on the third attempt, I managed to make something that fitted. Now my idea for actually holding these circuit boards in place on these carriers is I'm going to use my three doodler pen and I can just extrude a bit more plastic over the lips here and melt these lips a bit to actually lock things securely in place. So kind of like heat staking, but just a, a manual process. But it saves me having to work about worry about clamps or screws or anything like that. So here is my little model, and obviously it's not accurate for components, but it's approximately right for size. And we'll add in the power supply and add in my PCB carrier that holds it all together. Having got those bits worked out, I thought the next thing I should design was the solid state relay. And then I added in the microwave oven transformer to get the sizing about right. Um, I thought I'd better get the front panel components in place. So that's my OLED display. And let's just get that to look right. It's my OLED display and my rotary encoder. Um, I figured I'd also need a power switch on the front of things. Round at the back, I put in a fuse holder and an IEC inlet. And uh, once I got all that worked out, I could use those as cutouts to make a box to surround everything and hold all the components in the right place. Why isn't this rotating? 
And there we are, that's all our components in about the right places. Designed a front panel, uh, a couple of cable grommets to go around the chunky cable where it will go through the front. And last but not least, I designed a lid. Now, I've been through quite a few iterations, shall we say, to get all this work. So this was my first attempt at printing the base of this. And you can see we uh, warped away from the flatbed on the 3D printer. So that one was junk. But here's attempt number two. And all I actually did to make this print properly was expand the base around there and uh, I gave up on letting the printer generate its own support material so I built my own supports into the model so this prints cleanly with no support and a 5mm brim for bed adhesion. Next up I started doing the front panel for this. Um, this, was my, this was my first attempt I think, yeah. This was my first attempt, no? Yeah. This was my first attempt, but um, I wasn't happy with the way it had done or failed to do support material around these parts. So uh, I had another go at printing that one. And this was the second attempt, which after a small amount of filing, a uh, small amount of sanding just to get the edges to sit in nicely, sits in and locks in place around there. And then finally, the most difficult bit of all that caused me so many problems was getting the lid printed. My first attempt at the lid, the support material just wasn't possible to remove. So I slightly modified the design so it didn't need as much, but then I had lots of problems with it warping at the corners and I left a gap in my design, which is unfortunate. Attempt three on the lid, I printed it vertically, but that led to it bending as the lid went higher. Attempt four on the lid, uh, again, same problem with it warping. Attempt five on the lid, another redesign. Uh, somehow I managed to extrude too thin. Attempt six on the lid. I can't even remember what went wrong on that one. Uh, it was going badly. And finally, attempt seven on the lid. Seems to have printed cleanly last night. Let me get this off. There. So I built some support pillars out the back and they've just got little one mil tabs to join it in place, eight little one mil tabs down there to join it in place. So now I think I've got an enclosure that'll actually work and look pretty smart. So once I slice those bits off, that should fit on perfectly. And here we are all kind of assembled together. So. We're probably looking at 60 hours of printing alone, given the number of failures I had on this, um, plus designing and redesigning. I've put a lot of hours into this. I'll just give you a better look. Now, all of these bits are just press fitted at the moment, so the circuit boards have a tendency to ping out, and obviously there's no screws to hold the front together or anything. But that's my general layout. That's what I'm planning on. Display up there, rotary encoder over there, power switch here and around the back are mains inlets and then I'm going to work out some kind of pressure control mechanism and an arm that comes out of here with spring-loaded contacts to actually do the welding. Anyway I think that's more than enough for part two. Um, I'm going to sort out the electronics, I'm going to fix the timing even though it's only three quarters of a millisecond off just because I can and um, we'll see how we get on on part three where I'll design something to go out there as well. Anyway, thanks for watching folks, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time, bye!